right. Hopefully that means I'm live. Feel free to send me a message and let me know you can hear me. Welcome to another Earth Live lesson. I'm just going to wait another minute or so to let people log on. I don't want to start early. Um, so at the end of this, if they're not already down there, I'm going to put my details um, beneath here. So if you have any questions during, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll get to them at the end. And if you have any burning questions on SEALs after, uh, feel free to send me a message on Twitter or Instagram. So my watch says 12 o'clock, so I shall get started. So hello and welcome to another Earth Live lesson. My name is Jamie Coleman and I've already had the great pleasure of talking to you once before. So thank you very much, Lizzie, for having me back again. I guess that means I did something right. And commiserations to anyone who didn't like me last time. Sorry, I'm back. But just to recap, I am a marine biologist and field scientist, and I specialize in working in remote places far away uh, from people, but where there is lots and lots of wildlife. So examples of this are South Georgia uh, or the Farne Islands in the UK. So my last talk was all about albatross, and I would happily talk to you for another 10 sessions on albatross, but I'm going to save you. And today I wanted to focus a little more on seals. So during my time working for the British Antarctic Survey, I was lucky enough to work with a number of different species. And as a result, I got to know them fairly well. A few lessons ago, uh, Billy Heaney, I believe, gave a talk, a great talk on grey seals and seals of Great Britain, which I highly recommend you going and checking out. And seals are marine mammals, and they're found mostly in cold or temperate waters. And so today I am very excited to share a few of my favorite things about five species of seal found in the Southern Ocean or the waters surrounding Antarctica. So the first species I wanted to talk about was this guy behind me. Uh, this is an Antarctic fur seal, and you can see uh, they're very cute and incredibly inquisitive. But what starts as a five kilogram pup with no teeth eventually grows into one of the most abundant predators in the Southern Ocean. And this is an Antarctic fur seal male. It is the only representative of the eared seals found in Antarctica. And you can see here that they have these visible uh, external ear flaps and also the large fore flippers and the rotating hind flippers um, that come up and prop them up on all fours like a sea lion. And this means that they are very agile on land as well as in the water. And during the breeding season, uh, you want to make sure that you give these guys a wide berth because the males especially are full of testosterone, um, very aggressive and very defensive of their territories, and they will outrun you on a rocky beach. Now, one of the most obvious characteristics you can see about this guy here, I hope, is uh, also given away by their name, and they have this thick um, fur coat. And so, Obviously, when you're living in Antarctica or you're in extremely cold environments, uh, it is the ability to keep warm is integral to your survival. And so other seals, and I'm going to talk about, they have blubber. Fur seals have this super thick coat. Now, if we look uh, more closely at it, you can see just how dense that fur is. Um, and it's made up of a combination of thick underfur, which is this stuff, and then you've got the guard hairs as well. And so these work together in order to make sure that they stay warm and also dry. Whilst this is the key to their success here uh, in Antarctica, unfortunately, it was also their downfall. When Captain James Cook first discovered the island of South Georgia back in 1775, uh, he reported back on how plentiful the seals were with these lovely warm coats. And so by the early 1900s, this species was considered commercially extinct. 
Thankfully, now um, they have been protected, and what you see is that they are far from extinct. Although that's maybe a little bit overexposed on your screens, but maybe you can see these tiny little dots all over the, um, the beach. This is a standard breeding beach um, on South Georgia, which is home to four million seals, and that is 95% of their breeding population. So, why is this a good thing? Well, it shows what nature can do if we leave it alone, give it the protection it needs, and give it the chance to recover. But it also means that when you are on one of these islands at Christmas, you miss your friends, you miss your family, and you're not going to see them for a long time, um, you have two million of these awesome little pups running around your ankles, and all of a sudden you forget who your family are again. So next on the cards, um, is this guy. This is an elephant seal or a southern elephant seal and they get their, their name from their huge size and this famous proboscis nose that you see here um, which only the males have. But their scientific name actually refers to lions and that's because they use this huge proboscis um, like a microphone to amplify their roaring sounds. And so the southern elephant seal is the largest species of pinniped on the planet. And adult males can reach weights of four tons and lengths of five meters. Um, and for a little bit of perspective, that is larger than a hippopotamus. The females are comparatively much smaller. As you can see here, the poor girl getting squashed, they can be 10 times smaller than the males. And so this is an incredible example of sexual dimorphism, where males are physically uh, much different from the females. And one reason this exists in elephant seals is because the males have uh, extremely exhausting breeding habits. So every single year in August, thousands and thousands of elephant seals are going to arrive on South Georgia. And the males um, immediately start bellowing out their names, shouting threats to their neighbors and fighting. And what they're doing is they're trying to claim territory, um, their name as the beach master of the beach. And the bigger the male is, the bigger this proboscis is, the bigger the roar they can make, and therefore the bigger the territory they're going to hold. And you've probably seen footage of these famous fights between big males um, in nature documentaries and a beach master, he may have a group of females or a harem of a hundred females. So um, other males are going to try and take that away from him. And when you're um, standing beside these guys as they're fighting, it's absolutely incredible. Like you can genuinely feel the vibrations as they exchange blows right through your body and from the roars as well. And so fights like these they don't just happen once at the beginning of the breeding season, they actually happen uh, pretty much on a daily occurrence for three months or even longer. So these beach masters are going to shout and they're going to fight and they're going to defend their territory or their females. And the more and more tired they get, the more other challenges are going to start trying to fight them. So the harder it's going to get. So this sounds pretty difficult, pretty uh, challenging. Well, now consider doing this on an empty stomach because if you leave your beach then that's your territory gone the way other males aren't going to wait around for you to come back so there is no squid on the menu for the entire breeding season and so this fighting and fasting and fighting and fasting process means that they're going to lose as much as 12 kilograms of body weight every single day throughout this breeding season and that's about the same as losing five cute little chihuahuas every single day in body weight. And so over the course of a breeding season, that will be add up to over a ton potentially. And that's the same as an elephant seal shedding the weight of a walrus. So 25% of their body mass. So a very exerting breeding season for the bulls. Now, as we head south away from South Georgia, we get to the Antarctic continent and we start to encounter a few species of seal um, known as the ice seals. Um, and so these are circumpolar in their distribution, meaning that 
you can bump into them anywhere around the Antarctic continent on the sea ice. And the most common species of seal to encounter in Antarctica, and in fact, the most abundant species of seal on the planet is this one. This is the crab eater seal. And their name is a bit of a mis misnomer because they don't actually feed on crabs. Um, what they're actually feeding on it are these guys. It's quite difficult to see, it's very blown out, but you can see this uh, shrimp-like crustacean on the screen. And we refer to these as keystone species um, of the Antarctic ecosystem. And that just means that everything in Antarctica either eats krill or eats something that eats krill. So it is integral for life in Antarctica. And a single crab eater seal will consume um, 5,000 kilograms of krill in a year. And so considering that one of these guys only weighs two grams, and there is estimated to be between 10 and 18 million crab eater seals, uh, that's an awful lot of krill just to keep the crab eaters happy. Um, let alone all of the penguins and whales that want their share as well. So krill form these huge, huge groups, and we refer to them as swarms, and sometimes they can be so big that you can see them from space. And so that's what these crab eater seals and other animals are hoping to take advantage of. And the way they do this, well, the answer is in their teeth. So this here is a very simple outline of the teeth or the jaw of a gray seal. And you can see uh, it's quite bright, but also very pointy, standard uh, shaped teeth, what you would expect of a seal. Um, so they are eating very slippery prey, so they've got these pointy teeth. Now compare that to this, and you can see uh, this is the jaw of a crab eater seal. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, they have these teeth. Um, which have a pentacuspid structure. Uh, that just means that each of those teeth has five little tiny lobes on it. Um, those cusps are gonna come together and you can already see in this picture behind me and they almost form um, a sieve, a sieve-like structure. And that means that they can go into these big swarms of krill, uh, mouth wide open, and they're gonna take a, a massive mouthful of krill, close it around, and then they're gonna push through all, all the water, through all of these tiny gaps, leaving them of a tasty mouthful of krill. Pretty awesome adaptation, hey? Um, now, this guy here behind me is everyone, or tends to be everyone's favorite. Um, the leopard seals, they are intelligent, they are intimidating, and seeing them really, really gets your heart racing. Um, you've probably learned from nature documentaries that these guys, are the top predators in Antarctica, and they enjoy nothing more than the taste of penguins, and gen generally just making penguins' life really, really stressful. And this is true. Um, they also love the taste of seals. And you can see in this picture taken by a colleague of mine um, just how big they are. That head there, um, that's a leopard seal, that is comparable size to a horse's head. And when they want to grab something, they can open those jaws to about 60 degrees, meaning that this 100 kilogram uh, young crab eater seal is the perfect snack for a leopard seal. Now, forget those scary canines that you can see here. Um, on this side, massive canines, perfect for ripping apart penguins and seals. Um, but if you look at these teeth behind, they should remind you of um, something that we just saw. And that should be uh, the crab eater seal. They look just like a sieve again, meaning that as well as penguins and seals, leopard seals actually feed on krill. And in fact, a surprisingly high proportion of their diet is made up of krill, which they feed in exactly the same way as those crab eater seals. And another really cool aspect of the life of a leopard seal that is not particularly well talked about is that they are beautiful, beautiful singers. And I use beautiful very loosely here. Um, they are solitary animals and we don't always see them, but researchers have been studying them now uh, by putting hydrophones in the water. So this is an audio recorder you can put into the water and it records all of the sounds. 
And so they have shown that uh, males, especially throughout the breeding season, will spend up to 14 hours every single day uh, singing underwater. So for every one that we see above the water, there's potentially an additional 10 or 20 singing beneath the ocean. So a different side to a very brutal, efficient top predator, and also a really cool example of what we can learn by studying something in a different way or posing different questions. But leopard seals aren't the only singers in Antarctica, bringing me to this guy. This is a Weddell seal. They are the southernmost breeding mammal um, in the world, and they have the widest range of sounds of any seal. And so if I was to ask you to think of the sound of a seal or a sea lion, what would it sound like? Uh, uh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, most people tend to think of a, the, a sea lion sound. Well, here's an example of um, the ridiculous sounds Weddell seals make under the ice. something that I would say probably belongs in an episode of Doctor Who. And this is just one of 50 different vocalizations that they've been recorded making underwater. And even more amazing is that the researchers studying them say that you can hear those vocalizations through the ice, which can be several um, feet thick. So pretty impressive vocalizations there. But perhaps one of the coolest thing about the Weddell seals, especially for me, um, is their amazing abilities for diving. So what we see of these seals on the beaches or on the ice is just a tiny snippet of their life. And it's not the most glamorous snippet that we do see. In order to thrive and to be able to survive and find food uh, in their environments, they must be masters of holding their breath and diving underwater. And so Weddell seals, for example, have been recorded holding their breath for 80 minutes. Um, and diving to depths of 800 meters. And that is very impressive, but Weddell seals aren't even the champion divers. That title belongs to these guys. Remember them? The elephant seals. So bull elephant seals have been recorded diving for over two hours and down to depths of 2,400 meters. That's 1.5 miles deep. And that is about 24 times the height of Big Ben, or five times or over five times the height of the Empire State Building. So pretty incredible. And how on earth are they able to hold their breath for this long? Well, they have several amazing adaptations which form part of the mammalian dive reflex. And this is a set of physiological responses that all mammals, including us humans have, uh, when you immerse your water into cooler water. And so one of the key things that happens when these seals dive is a process called bradycardia or bradycardia. And that is the slowing of their heart rate. And this is gonna help them conserve oxygen. It's also gonna decrease the work on their heart. Um, and in order to help demonstrate this, um, I have my handy volunteer, who you might remember from uh, my albatross lesson. Here is Maya. Now, she has kindly been volunteered by me um, in order to put her face in this uh, bowl of very cold water. Um, it's not quite cold enough, so um, I'm going to ask her to put some more ice in it. And I'm actually going to just read her heart rate um, as she does this. So good luck, Ooh, Maya. It's really high. Are you ready? She's obviously nervous, apprehensive uh, to put her face into the cold water. I don't blame her. So already her heart rate is at 107 beats per minute. So I'm reading this off of the watch on her wrist. So <laughs> jump in. You ready? Jump in. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. So already we're starting to see her heart rate drop. So it's now beneath 100 beats per minute. And so um, 
The difference here is not going to be as extreme as something we see in an elephant seal. Their heart rate when they go down to the bottom of their dive potentially is going to reach two beats per minute. But already she's down at 90 beats per minute and it is continuing uh, to drop. I really hope Myers doesn't reach two beats per minute because then we have a problem. Um, 88, 85 beats per minute. So you can see how it's dropping. And whilst this is an adaptation that seals have in order to survive, um, humans actually have the ability to, to train this. And so there are free divers that can hold their breath for 22 minutes um, and their heart rate will drop uh, to about 20 beats per minute. So we're now down at 75. So this is average heart rate. So she's got over that initial anxiety, uh, 72. Uh, 68 and she's doing a good job here at, at holding her breath um, and so seals of course have uh, several other adaptations so before she dries herself off so we got down to 60 beats per minute so not as extreme as what you might see in a professional freediver in a, a proper environment so actually jumping into those frigid antarctic waters uh, but you can start to see the effect um, so as I was saying, seals have several other adaptations, um, such as they can, um, additional to slowing their heart rate, including having a really high blood volume, as well as lots of oxy oxygen stores across their body. But this was just a very um, simple experiment to show uh, you the mammalian dive reflex and how simple exposure to cold water can trigger this response to help us survive longer. Um, so please don't try this at home without supervision or someone to do it with you. Um, more importantly, what it does show is um, what Maya is willing to do in order to get onto TV. Um, so there you go. Um, we think of seals as these kind of smelly, noisy, blubbery sausages that we see hauling around on beaches. But I hope this gave you uh, an insight into some other aspects of their life. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna try and answer some of these questions. So, a question from Instagram. Do different seal species eat one another? That is a great question. Um, so the only species of seal that does this regularly um, is the leopard seal. There are records of uh, walrus up in the Arctic. Um, they Most of their prey is actually uh, tiny little mollusks um, that they find in the seabed, but there are records of um, walrus eating other smaller seals, ring seals up in the Arctic. So yes, it does happen. Uh, do I support ecotourism? That is a great question. Um, I work in the ecotourism industry. I think it can be done very well. I also think that often it is done very badly and eco is used as an excuse to sell things for a higher price. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it results in animals uh, being put under greater stress than they, they need to be. But it is a great way of uh, educating people about these animals and in order to gain interest and make people want to protect and conserve energy, uh, these animals, ecotourism is a really great tool to help us do this. So, um, Millie, do you have a favorite seal? That is a um, great question. And my favorite seal is the ones that I started with. I um, lived, as I said, with four million of these for the best part of two years of my life. So Antarctic fur seals are incredible. Uh, the pups especially are just like puppies. Uh, they're really inquisitive. They chase you. I remember my first year and a half going to my study beach. Um, they used to, um, there was this lake called Puppy Lake and there would be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seal pups that would go there just to practice swimming um, late in season. And you would come down and I always had the Jurassic Park um, theme tune going through my head. And as you got to the edge of this lake, you would see all of the fur seals. They would porpoise over through the water to come greet you. And then as you walked along the side of the lake, they would be porpoising alongside you. And then as you walked past the lake, they then all get out of the water and start chasing you. Um, now the pups, they like to think that they're they're brave and strong like the adults, um, but the second you turn around and look at them, they will stop. And then you carry on walking again, and then they stop again if you look at them. 
And if you take one step towards them, they all just run as fast as they can. So awesome. So much fun working with them. And those big, scary males, yeah, they get your heart racing when you're living in amongst them. So, yes, I agree um, with Deborah um, and also Lizzie. Uh, a big thank you to Maya. Um, good effort, rather you than me. Um, and in fact, I think on Wednesday, you're going to be doing a, another Earth Live lesson. Um, so you'll get to see what Maya does, which is cold water diving. So an insight into the cold waters of Antarctica. Um, so thank you very thank you. much. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you've enjoyed. And as I said, if you have any questions, if you're looking at this again later, feel free to reach out on Instagram or Twitter or send me an email and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.